Martin, thank you so much for your patience. We appreciate you coming out here today at such short notice. Um, our first presenter, Deputy Prime Minister, Honorable Dr. Ernest Dile, and Minister for Tourism, Investment, Creative Industries, Culture, and Information will speak with us. Um, he will brief us on the success of the ICC World Cup cricket matches, which occurred in June. No, Thank you very much. Of course, we can probably start off any questions you have on Carnival. Sure. Um, you would all agree that we had a phenomenal Carnival, the, probably the largest Carnival we've had in our history in terms of the number of bands and the number of revelers as well. I think it's probably the first time we have had about four bands approximating at least a thousand revelers, oh. um, which was really um, excellent. Um, the national events, um, Soka Monarch, uh, Calviso Monarch, uh, King and Queen of the Bands all showed very impressive turnout and participation by the public. Um, the fringe events, the, the FETs, the um, Calami Red, Euphoria, um, the numbers were really, really impressive. And we, we saw from all accounts, you know, that the visitor arrival um, was significant. <clears throat> the winners would have been announced in the various categories, the various events, and I'm sure um, each of us have our own view on, on it, um, but it is what it is. The judges have made a decision and must all be respected. Um, I think we've already started the review of this year. It's typical of Carnival that before it even ends, people are already doing all the reviews and all the critics. Um, we must never be afraid of criticism and persons expressing their views is the only way we can get better, actually, is when we, the deficiencies are pointed out to us and we can work on them. So we're already starting to think of next year and how we're going to even improve the product. So any questions that you have on this um, would be okay. And I want to share with you more than just the ICC, to share with you the June arrival figures okay. for St. Lucia. You would have heard the statement made by the opposition that there were no visitors to St. Lucia. And, you know, it was a waste of money and a waste of time. Um, you even saw a recent posting that work was still continuing on the Darren Sami Cricket Ground, which I wouldn't mind saying a few things about. Um, so let's get started if any questions you sure. have about the carnival season. So um, I have to start out by speaking about our influencers that were here for Carnival. Yeah. Um, we saw a number of them, um, <coughs> some very, very popular names here for Carnival. Speak to the importance of that in growing the festival. Yeah, I think even beyond just the festival, we, we live in an age now where marketing and promotions and marketing in particular um, is taking a new direction, a new shape, a new form. Um, there were days when um, you would travel to major countries and the way in which we promote the destination is through huge billboards, um, on television ads, um, even taking in um, inserts in newspapers, costing tens of thousands of dollars, and in some cases hundreds of thousands of dollars to do so. Uh, with the emergence of social media, it has transformed how people market. Um, marketing still would encompass some of the traditional methods, but you now have this added use of, of social media to market. And it is a lot cheaper, a lot, lot cheaper than the traditional methods. If you compare the cost of a 30 second ad on CNN, advertising the destination, or the cost of a billboard on the, the M5 in the UK or whatever, to having an influencer who with a single posting can reach hundreds of thousands of persons directly targeted to them. So it, it really, it, it's really a new age of, of marketing, the use of influencers, the use of persons that the public would follow, would, would follow their, their posts, follow their views, and it's the use of that. And it has proven to be highly effective. And now with the advent of AI, it's becoming even more targeted and more streamlined where you can actually hit exactly the profiles of the persons that do come to St. Lucia and that you do want to come to St. Lucia. So the use of influencers is the, one of the new things in the new age of marketing. And like I said, it's proven to be highly effective. Um, I, I think it has been very successful for us. 
Um, we got our first real taste of it with um, Chloe Bailey last year when she came for Carnival. And even the criticized Bamba Mall, in a sense, um, was hugely successful in terms of promoting St. Lucia and our Carnival products um, using social media because people were posting, um, you know, that, you know, I, I'm enjoying myself on this. And you will notice this year we did a lot of branding because one of the criticisms we got of last year is that people are taking photos of themselves on the roads in St. Lucia and posting it, but nobody knew where is that place. Yeah. So we sort of put strategic in strategic places um, branding of St. Lucia. So anyone who takes a photograph, somebody seeing it would realize that they are in St. Lucia. Uh, and probably next year you will see even more branding um, at the airports, um, because persons take photos at the airports that they've arrived in this country for this, for whatever. But we want others who are viewing the post to see where, where they are. Um, so, you know, we, we, we're very satisfied with that campaign and we will continue to use influencers. We've also used local influencers because I've heard some of the criticism. Now, you know, in this life, there'll always be some people who are critical. Um, they always have a different perspective and that's good. That's, that, that's the flavor of our society, of our life. So somebody said to me, oh, you're not using local people. And that's not true. We have a, a Carnival Ambassadors program where every year we name the Carnival Ambassadors for the year. And this year, again, we had an expanded list of local artists um, that promoted St. Lucia using the same social media. Same social media. So this idea that we're not using local artists is not true. The difference, though, is that our local artists don't have the reach of those international celebrities. They don't. They probably have, you know, a few thousand followers. Um, but the international celebrities have hundreds of thousands. I mean, they, they will put up a post and overnight it will get a couple million views. And you compare that to our smaller followings that we have locally. But we have used um, local persons, the Ezra's and the Afales and the, the Rikitis and them, um, to be um, local celebrities that promote our, our festival. All right. Um, just Let them, Add to what you're talking about, the influencers. Um, have you seen this translated in, in real figures in terms of arrivals and people uh, yeah. coming there? Can you give us some data? Apart from the, I mean, obviously the, the, the reach on social media, can we get some real? Well, I mean, I cannot tell you um, 800 persons came because of an influencer. Yeah. What I can tell you is that our numbers are phenomenal because of the use of influencers. And, and you will see even next year, a continued growth because St. Lucia's product is becoming better known and the quality of the product is becoming better known. So whereas you can't get a specific number that said this person who came came because of that influencer, it's not done that way, but you can correlate the use of certain strategies to um, to those persons and the, the spaces in which they operate. Yeah, yeah, I can tell you. Last year, we probably, during the period, the first two weeks of July, we had 18,000 arrivals. I can tell you this year, we're way above that. Um, and you will, you, you, you will see it when we release the figures um, shortly, well, in the next few weeks. All right. Um, I think you might be the perfect person to answer the, fol the following question. I know that you are a lover of street art. And I also know that you're a carnival enthusiast. We saw somebody who seems to be a foreigner on top of one of our monuments in Castries. Um, it yeah. was on the roundabout. Um, how do we encourage revelry and you know, having a good time, but also find ways to respect the monuments during Carnival or whatever festival that we have? I mean, that's totally unacceptable. And I mean, if somebody does that, um, it should be strongly discouraged. Um, I, you know, it's just unacceptable. People have to still respect um, our monuments, our paintings, whatnot. And, Sometimes people drink, and in their own enthusiasm and exuberance, they can stray. And we, we should always, both as the law enforcement, as well as, as citizens, discourage people from doing that nonsense. You, you, you can't go on our monument. You need to get off. And maybe they should have taken that person and put them in a safe place to cool off until the following morning. But, I mean, that's my view. Uh, Mr. Minister, uh, while you spoke about a good morning, good job, by the way, of the carnival this year, I think, from all the reviews. I saw you enjoying yourself. Oh, yes, I did. I did. Um, while you spoke of traditional and non-traditional methods of marketing, I want to delve into the non-traditional accommodations. And I will give some background and to provide context. Uh, the last administration, they looked at taxing uh, Airbnbs. 
and registering and taxing Airbnbs. Now, I don't, I'm not sure I agree with the taxing part, but the registration. Um, do you believe that we're not capturing, or there's more to be captured in terms of the full economic impact of the carnival? Because while we capture arrivals and the hotels may give their figures, uh, there are people who rent their apartments as Airbnbs for carnival, and these places are full. Um, is are we looking at ways of capturing that that kind of info going forward? Because I'm sure it could actually show Carnival our the impact of Carnival is much larger than what we capture now. Yeah, well, I mean there there are mechanisms. We do track it. Huh? We we have the the, the right tools uh, for us to track when it happens because a lot of the ANB are booked online and anything you book online it, it can be tracked. So we, we there are tools that can track how significant it is. So. Um, yes, that, that, that's possible. But think about it. Once we register the arrivals, they have to stay somewhere. So they either stay in the formal sector, um, they stay at relatives, or they stay in the home accommodation. They, they only have those options. We don't have, you know, um, 10 CTs or anything like that. So they must be in some form of accommodation. So we know from the reports we get from the hotels. We're able to track accommodation at the hotels based on they pay the tourism levy per room. So we know based on the month um, what they paid, what the occupancy was. Um, right now we don't, um, like you say, ask the home accommodation to pay the levy. It is something that we will have to do. Um, and we will have to do it because we need to ensure certain standards. We need to ensure that we can promote them. And that money they pay goes towards the promotion. And we need to formalize the informal sector. We should not be calling it informal sector anymore. We'll categorize it as home accommodation. And they too have to come into mainstream because we have to ensure that standards are met, you know, so all the required certification, um, you know, provisions are met. So when someone comes to St. Lucia, um, they, we have to make sure and they stay in one of those places that's insured, it meets all the safety requirements, so you don't expose yourself to lawsuits and, and whatnot. Um, but I can tell you, the home accommodation sector did very, very well. Very, very, very. Just one more thing on that. Um, what do you make of the statement? I saw it on social media that um, while they gave Carnival all the praise, some, they said that Carnival has become too big for St. Lucia. What do you make of that statement and do you agree? Um, I, I look at it differently. Um, it might be the same, a, a different version of that same point. And there's nothing wrong in we saying that our Carnival as is has gotten too big because in some respects it is true. And let me explain to you. And we must not be ashamed to, to say those things. And don't, we, don't, we should not get defensive. And as policymakers and persons involved in organizing it, we must never get defensive. We must always look beyond it and to see whether there is some element of reality in it. So just think about that. The Sunday before Carnival, there were eight fets in St. Lucia. Eight fets. And that builds on all what happened during the week. So you can imagine having to have infrastructure for eight fets. Eight fets. At the same time, those feds require, say, for example, crash barriers. But we need the crash barriers on the entire route by Monday morning. So you can imagine people rushing between events, infrastructure. I, okay, for example, I can give you another example. Say for Calamie Red, Euphoria is usually the same venue the day before. So there's just a, some adjustments that are made. But when Euphoria is done by Caribbean cinemas, some of the same infrastructure that they have to be at Calamie Red. So it means they have to break it down fr um, Friday morning and go and mount it at, Bos at the Darren Sami in time for Friday night because they're using the same service provider. So you can understand why the event will start a little late because everything has to be broken down and moved there. Now you have so many events taking place at the same time. Now somebody can say, well, have enough infrastructure for all the fests you're going to have. But that's once in a year, once a year, or maybe twice a year with jazz, although jazz does not have as many events as Carnival, that you have such a huge demand. You can't invest in infrastructure that you will only use once a year. So the guys who are doing the, the setting up the infrastructure for the various events, they're under tremendous pressure. Even the suppliers of drinks and the, 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 the drink trucks, because at an, a big event, I want to have a supply truck parked right outside throughout the night, so if my whiskey runs short, I can go and buy two cases or three cases. But those guys, for the last four nights, they're out. So they can't be out again tonight. So you then find yourself in an event at the, the back end, where if you fall short in drinks, you have no backup. So all those things we need to address. So for example, the infrastructure one, I have said to some of the guys, you need to have two crews a setup crew and a demolition crew. So the, the crew sets up and they go home. 
And by the time the show finishes, your demolition crew comes in, takes it down, drops it at the next venue for the setup crew to then come and, and set up. And not the same crew doing everything. Now the same crew that is setting up, demolishing, they also want to go to the event. And they also have to sleep. Look at the police officers. The police did a fantastic job this carnival. And we really must applaud them and the emergency services. Last year they had the support of the RSS. This year they didn't have RSS, so they had to do it by themselves. But they also police in the eight feds on the Sunday. And they have to report to duty, you know, on the parade route early Monday morning. So think about the stress and the strain that they go under during, during that period. So when somebody says it is too big for us, you mustn't, you know, you must sit back and look at exactly what is being said. Um, I think the time has come for us to really have a big conversation, and I think all of us have agreed that the time has come for a big conversation, because the ultimate thing for us is to find the right balance between economic impact and cultural expression and creative expression, and how do we find that balance? The balance doesn't mean equal, it just means how do we weigh the different influences, because um, we've reached a point where we can take off to another level, but we need to put in place the elements to sustain that takeoff. We, we start to plateau as to what we are capable of carrying. So we need to bring either more efficient methods of management, managing the road. Think about that. Managing the road with four bands, a thousand plus, it's not easy. I can tell you from being on the road, it's a phenomenal stress and strain on the band management to be able to do so, to feed over a thousand people ice, drinks, food, security, movement. Um, it's a lot. The police to so make sure the bands don't meet up, they don't cross each other. You know, I mean, it, it takes a lot. So um, we need to sit down and reflect on our capacity, reflect on how we're going to grow, what are the elements we need to sustain that growth, and how government can support the industry to make sure it's present. But on the, on the topic of infrastructure for events, though, I know that, that we really want to tap into that, that side of, our, of the tourism market um, to become more of an uh, events, I, I don't want to say capital, but uh, 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 more of an uh, events destination, mm -hmm. right? So wouldn't the um, developing the infrastructure, I mean, you said it would be for like maybe once a year, but wouldn't developing the infrastructure help facilitate that throughout the year or other parts of the year? No, you need the infrastructure. Yeah. But you cannot have, you cannot invest in the infrastructure for your peak. Okay. Because it means for the rest of the day is underutilized. What you probably have to do is to find means of managing what you have so that it's optimum and it can serve throughout. For example, if you're going to have eight FETs on a Sunday, you can have eight units available because that's the only day you will have eight FETs. Um, what you probably can do is how you manage what you have so you can sustain um, everything. I mean, I, I just think we need to have a conversation with service providers too because when you put on an event and you put in tens of thousands of dollars up front for an event, you really don't want service providers not coming through for you. It, it, it can really cause a, a problem. Um, so, yeah, we, we're going to have that conversation. Okay. Mm. Um, as it pertains to the event for the events for Carnival this year, we had an extended time period mm -hmm. up to 7 p.m. But um, I think a number of factors, the weather affected vendors, for example, and the fact that the second day by 4 o'clock, bands were on the route headed up, that left the populated cashews region more or less void of activity. Mm -hmm. um, I, mean, I mean, in retrospect, probably we could do something different. What are your thoughts on how we could probably capitalize on that time period where the bands, the last band perhaps, may have been then the route of cash trees and, um, you know, headed up by 4 o'clock, 4.30, and we have no activity in town. So in terms of town activities actually dead and vendors relying on that time period for them to be able to make something happen for themselves. I, I, again, I, I read that some of the vendors said they were a little disappointed, the weather affected them, whatnot. Um, and again, is that continued search? Because initially, the cutoff was 6 p.m., and we really persuaded the police that if we're having a good day and there's no trouble and no issues with the, the spectators, um, we extend it as much as possible. But the police does not want, and you can imagine, to have four or five bands, which they send 8,000 people at Mega J Junction, just their music blasting, and everybody, they, they don't have the capacity to police that. That, that's the truth, given our circumstances. Uh, so they rather, as soon as you, you reach, you cut off the music, everybody go your way, do what you have to do, allow for, for the crowd to disperse. 
you could keep the crowd longer in, in, in cashiers, and I already had discussions with one of the police commanders about that. If you're going to have four big bands in castries, you have to make sure castries can sustain four or 5,000 revelers at the same time. Because if you say stay longer, so vendors too can benefit and the public can have a, a better spectacle. And I must tell you, we have to address it because we speak about the revelers and the experience, we speak about the bands, we speak about television viewers, but the spectator experience we must also focus on. We cannot lose the spectators. They have to be willing to come out and see Carnival and enjoy it. The vendors as well. So if we're going to keep the bands in castries longer, it's more stress on the police to make sure along the entire route in castries remain safe and secure and avoid the bands clashing because there'll be four big bands in castries, you know, which is over 4,000, maybe 5,000 revelers. How do you manage it? So yes, we had to find ways of doing it. This year they tried some new techniques, two small bands, two big bands, two small bands, two big bands, you know, to try and to, to stagger it in a way like that to make sure there's a free flow. But I think by the second day, persons knowing that there's a cutoff time wanted to get onto the highway to, to, to able to maximize the time. You don't want to be cut off by Northwest and you have to get all the way up to Mega G with no music. So again, it's finding that right balance. And that's, that's what I spoke about. Let's talk about how we're going to manage it. Make sure the vendors get the best out of it. Make sure the spectators get the best out of it. Make sure the revelers get the best out of it. Make sure the band management get the best out of it. You know, just on a lighter side, when you're a band manager and, and you see rain coming, you're almost happy because, you know, less drinks will be consumed <laughs> than if the sun is blazing hot, you know, for, for, for two days. Um, so, you know, and, and as a band manager, you want people to get up as quickly as possible. The more they stay on the road is the more they drink. So, you know, the, the, the stress on your supplies um, would be tremendous. So, again, is that conversation. How are we going to manage all the elements? I would have loved to see the bleachers uh, along the route so St. Lucians can sit down and watch Carnival as they get standing up for an entire day. I mean, that's getting a little, you know, um, out of style. You know, people now want to sit down on the bleachers and watch what happens. So where do we put the bleachers along the route? But well, we have the bleachers now. We bought them for this year. So for the, the Soka Monarch and Calypso Monarch, we had bleachers. And you saw they were well used by the public. Um, so where do we put them along the route to make sure, you know, spectators can sit down in some comfort? How do we get covering for them so if it rains, they won't get wet? So there, there are a lot of things we have to do to improve the product still, uh, and we'll continue to work on it. <coughs> yeah. All right, so let me just give you a little update on June. Um, you know, we hosted ICC Cricket World Cup in June um, in St. Lucia, and June is traditionally a very low month. Um, for St. Lucia. So I will give um, Melissa a copy of the data um, and I will share with you some of the, the data coming out um, for, for the month of June. Um, just allow me to. So in June, we saw a 42% increase in arrivals for the month of June, 42% increase. All the four main markets recorded increases led by the US with a 55% month-on-month in increase. Um, of course, you know we had increase in seats um, over last June. The, it, the um, American Airlines second daily service from Miami, JetBlue second daily service from New York, and of course, American Airlines upgraded its frequency from Charlotte. Um, the Caribbean grew by 24% over June last year. Um, we had more flights from Inter-Caribbean as well as Caribbean Airlines. Uh, the non-traditional markets, which is grouped as the rest of the world, recorded a 327% increase. And of course, a lot of that came for persons who came for cricket, the international teams and spectators. We had spectators from India, South Africa, Afghanistan, Australia, and Sri Lanka. Um, the month of June was the fourth consecutive month of record-breaking arrivals and the fifth month for the year. Yet to date, the island is 15% ahead of arrivals recorded for the first half of 2023. So we, we're 15% ahead of last year and 6% ahead of 2019. And you know, 2019 was our best year on record. So we already up to June, 6% ahead of 2019 and 15% ahead of where we were last year. So, I mean, it's fantastic news for us. And it showed the impact that cricket had um, on our arrivals during the month of June. And of course, like I said, the July numbers, which we expect to be 
um, even better than last year's July, which was the best July ever. Um, so we're really looking forward to some very strong numbers. And I, I don't need to say any more. Any talk that tourism is crashing and nothing is happening in tourism and there were no visitors coming for um, cricket, um, you can get the official data um, from Melissa who will share it with you. And that's also ah. made the, the average rising cost of a ticket, the average cost of a ticket. I'm actually going to ask about that. Um, I actually spoke to a couple of Indian fans because I attended many of the matches. Um, they, they said that they, they didn't have any issues with St. Lucia in particular as a host destination. What they did have issues with, however, is the ICC. Some of the issues were getting into the venue. The ticket prices were difficult, and also getting tickets in general was difficult. So what was the tourism board's experience with that? In terms of the experience when they did come to St. Lucia, what was the experience? No, I mean, things like the ticket prices and those things are beyond us. Uh, and you have to understand how the system works. When tickets go on sale, persons buy tickets. They don't know if their team, especially second round, because they don't know who's qualifying to go to the next round. So I anticipate my team, I buy a ticket. But my team doesn't make it, or I can't get a flight to come to the country, but I have the ticket, I have the seat. So sometimes you see empty seats and you say, what, nobody turned up for the, the seats. All the seats are sold. It's just that some people could not, could not get the flight to come. Yeah, tickets, yeah. yeah, so th th there are people who buy tickets and, you know, there's the match India versus, I think, Australia was sold out. But the point is, there's still a lot of empty seats because some people just can't make it to the venue. They cannot make it to the island. In other countries with many multiple ways of moving around, you can take a train to the venue, you can fly, you can take bus. You know, we are islands. You have to get a flight or take a boat to come in. So sometimes that, that is what happens. Airline ticket prices, let me tell you, is way beyond us. <laughs> There's a demand for the destination. As long as people are buying tickets, prices will go up. Okay. Uh, I've had the experience already where sitting with an airline, we virtually chastise them. Why your price is so high? And they ask us, well, what's the problem? We say, well, your ticket prices are too high. I said, yeah, but our, our load factor is 90 something percent. People are buying it at that high price. So what are you complaining about? So, yes, so we are complaining it's too high, but people are buying it. And you know, market supply and demand is, is that. If you are buying at that price, I will sell it at that price. Why should I drop my price when you're buying it at a high price? And we have no control over that. We need more, more flights, more and more flights. But to get more flights, you need more rooms. And then again, you know, it has to work its way out. Okay. I think that's it, yeah. I have a, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Especially what happened in America. I know um, your character was, well, well um, they tried to assassinate your character. Mm -hmm. And with what happened in America, how is it important that politicians don't incite violence or anything like that? No, I mean, th th this is a very serious point. And you can imagine for persons like myself, you know, watching, you know, those events when they take place and knowing the nature of copycats and all those things. Um, as politicians, we have an obligation not to be insightful. Um, it's one thing to ignite the passion of people. It's another thing to be insightful. And it's something the Prime Minister always makes a, a very clear point about. Um, and, he's, and he's right, and we all believe that. Let, let us debate issues. Let me show you how you were wrong in what you did. And I always go back to the DSH issue. We, we said, look, this was a bad agreement. We did not support the, um, the agreement. We support development. And you can go and find all the statements. And here we give you 15 points where it is a bad agreement. And can you go back and renegotiate it? We never said run after DSH. We never call anybody crooked or corrupt. We said it was a bad agreement that had to be renegotiated. Whether it was Ojo Lads, we said, look, this is a bad agreement. Can you renegotiate it? It's not in the interest of St. Lucia. When it was Carbot, we criticized the process. You never heard us call anybody, well, certainly not at the leadership at which I was at. I cannot tell you for everybody on Facebook, but certainly at our level, not calling people corrupt and not um, declaring war uh, and saying you're serving notice on people from now on and what we need is war. And we've heard for the last two years from the opposition repeated statements of violence. And they all documented saying we need to do those things. 
you know, Peter Josie about Vuford, he would have told the boys, you know, in Vuford what they should have done. And example after example of that, that's inciting persons to behave in a particular manner. I, I rather debate anybody, anytime, on facts and figures and reasoning. And let me, let me expose you. Let me expose, let me take you on. And, and that's the way we approach it, but not to, you know, incite personal hatred and, and dis dislike for people because the consequences can be very grave. Um, but for some people, it's their pathway to victory um, to, to do so. Um, we, we will not go down that road. Uh, and certainly, um, we're very clear in our minds that we will expose shortcomings and present alternatives, but not to, to, to do so. And it really just tells you in a society where the political discourse has degenerated, um, what can happen, and especially persons who may not be of the right emotional balance. Um, they, they, they might just decide, you know, let me take action and, and do something about it. And we don't want that to happen. We want, you know, in debate on issues and, and argument about issues and, and not incite personal hatred for individuals and push some people over the edge. We, we don't need that. And it's a theme that's going to feature moving forward because we really, as a small society, do not need it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.